deal. But tonight's topic, everybody, is about being the bank. And I am going to say this will be the last time that we will post this online. I'm going to force everybody to come back in the room, right? Only because it's so much better, just the energy of having 30, 40 people in the room as opposed to 15 or 20 people on a Zoom. We'll probably record it. We'll more than likely put it behind a paywall, though, or some something, only because the collaboration that occurs in person is so much different than doing it online, right? So the way we normally love to start these off, though, is by giving you a little quick background on the topic that we're going to talk about, and then also doing some basic introductions uh, so that investors get to know each other, even in this online environment. And so um, I'll just kind of start off, everybody. My name is Rob Chavez. I am one of the facilitators of this group. Uh, I've got the pleasure of, of running it with Mark Beckett, my business partner, who's here working on the, hey, you can jump in there. Easy. This guy. I'm here, here. This guy. And um, we've been running this now for the last uh, decade. And we help real estate investors build uh, investment businesses uh, that are worth owning. And we cover topics every single month that help them move their business forward. It's not just investors, it's agents, it's investors, it's people that are just getting started, super experienced people that have done a lot of deals. Uh, how many deals have you done today, this year? What's going on? Awesome. Yeah. I've done uh, the third five and a half, uh, six more. 35 deals year to date, nice. six more in the pipeline, right? Six more in the pipeline. So we've got experienced investors and then we've got people that are just starting off, right? Uh, we've got somebody who just bought a property in Baltimore. Astro just bought a property in Baltimore. Everybody's trying to talk her out of buying this property in Baltimore. Right, but no, it's good. You gotta learn, right? Um, and it'll probably be good. It'll work, it'll work out, right? Um, and so why don't we do some quick intros online? Andy, why don't you introduce yourself if I just get off and say, hey, what do you who are you? What do you do? How you doing? Uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Andrew Moore. I'm president of Arlington Designer Homes. We are a general contractor. Um, working primarily in Arlington of Falls Church City, doing new single family homes and remodels. Um, and then personally, I uh, own a few rentals um, and, uh, you know, I'm interested in the real estate market in general and, and just kind of, um, you know, seeing what you guys are up to. There you go. We have to mute one of these. What you want to are good? Okay. So Andy is a phenomenal home builder. Um, you're still doing all green construction? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we pride ourselves on, you know, kind of a, a, a minimum level of uh, energy efficiency at home, into air quality, things like that. And so that kind of is one of our value propositions that separates us from other builders in our market. Awesome, man. And what brings you here tonight? I just wanted to see what you're up to. I've uh, been kind of circling around, um, you and Grid and, um, you know, for years and, uh, um, uh, you know, I had, had a few moments here. I'm gonna have to hop off in about an hour, but, um, uh, but had a few moments uh, this afternoon to, uh, you know, just kind of see what you guys are up to. And so wanted to awesome. be a part of what you guys are doing and, and, and just hear what, what, what other people have to say. All right. Well, the, the, this group is all, all about collaboration, about networking. We realize that the powers in the network all all the investing that you want to do, all the deals you want to do, all the learning you want to do happens with all the relationships that are in this room. And so, yes, you could pay tens of thousands of dollars to some guru that's going to go out there and teach you how to do stuff. Or you could just show up here every month. We cover topics. We collaborate. We, I engage the room. And, uh, and really, it's like the powers of the network. That's, that's what this is all about. So thank you for joining us today, Andy Moore. Anybody? Teresa, I saw you on here. Jump, jump in and introduce yourself real fast. Put on here. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've been a full-time rehabber since 2016, 2015. Did some small projects before that, but went full-time then. Uh, have been coming to grid meetings, multiple ones, but started in this with Rob and Mark uh, in to, late 2015. And still find it extremely valuable because it's all about the network. It's all about the network. Um, started as a lender in 2016, 
Um, I actually ran into Andrew Moore when I had a house up on Langley Street in Arlington. And uh, we, we, uh, I never ended up actually renovating that house because I sold it um, because the numbers weren't working out. And then four months, no, six months later, Amazon announced that it, whoop, that it was, um, that it was coming to town. And that house that I could not have gotten fixed up, I could barely, I would have gotten about 625,000 for is, is worth at least eight, 850 now. So it's, it's all about timing too, right? <laughs> but Andrew, Andrew was very kind um, in showing me the work he was doing and some of the houses he was building uh, and, and taught me a lot actually just interacting with him over probably a period of four months or so. And uh, so it's great to see you here because it's been years since I ran into you. But again, it's it's your network and you learn from everybody. It's a, it's a small world. Andy, do you remember how you and I met? I do. I do. Yeah. I walk past the house. I walk past that house all the time. There's a new park right across from the house that just opened up. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a, it was an open house, right? It was an open house and he was shopping open houses and, um, and I was, I think a fairly new agent and he gave me a shot to sell a property that he had on military road. And wow. I always appreciate I appreciate you giving me that shot, Andy. So thank you. Um, and then, and, and Happy the to know. I, I think Andy and I met, like we've known each, well, we didn't know each other, but we went to second grade together, which is kind of weird, right? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So small world, right? So this business is all about relationships. Obviously you could just tell right there, these are, I mean, DMV is huge. And Teresa and Andy, like you didn't know you're gonna be on tonight and here you are making a connection again. So. Awesome. Who else is on here that'd like to brave up and introduce themselves real fast? Anybody? Okay. If you, if you want to, what we've done online is put your information in the chat. If you're new to the business, say, hey, I'm new. If you're a builder, say, I'm a builder. If you're a lender, say, I'm a lender. Put your information in the chat, and then I'm going to encourage everybody on here to get that information and put it into your database because really this business is about forming relationships with people and the power is in the network. Uh, I'm going to introduce real fast here, Thomas Price. He's not on, we can't keep, nobody can see you on your top. Well, actually you go on your phone, right? But Thomas uh, runs our property management arm. He was a director of opera operations for seven years for CASA. And then he, he decided to Start his own property management business under Home Pro Property Management, which was awesome. So he's here tonight if you guys are looking for property management. Um, and then Aster, Aster's new to Kaz. You can't see her on here. You haven't logged in, right? But uh, Aster's looking to work more on the investor side of the business. And um, she's done a lot of builder luxury new construction in the past. So very excited about that. Mr. Beckett, you want to introduce yourself real fast before What's we get up? started? Everybody, I think you can see me, right? You can see me, but the microphone is over there. Yeah, but you can't. Or maybe I'll just come over here. Yeah, you now you can see me in two places. Check this out. Rob, you vamp for that camera. Well, I say hi. What's up, everybody? Mark Beckett. Uh, so, yeah, clearly we need to get people back in the room here. We have some wonderful good friends here uh, tonight, and we're happy to see them. We want to see everybody else. So, we're going to have to do all this back and forth uh, camera nonsense. We can really talk about doing deals. Because that's why I'm here. I've done a lot of deals with the people that I've met in this room, uh, and I'm looking for more. I am a rehab investor, buy and hold investor. I run Kaza Construction, our construction arm, uh, that does our renovation work and some third-party work for uh, some of our clients. Uh, happy to grab a coffee, have lunch, talk about how our business works, what we do for a living, what doesn't work, whatever works for you, right? I uh, was just looking to connect and, and hang out. So. Uh, I'll drop my contact information along with Rob's into the chat for those that are on the chat. And for those that are here, we'll get to hang out uh, for a little bit after we talk about our topic tonight and maybe do uh, a little bit of business. That's really where the money's at, right? So make sure that uh, you start dropping in because uh, we're going to make some money here. So yeah. good to see everybody. And talking about money, 
tonight is all about being the bank. Yep. Right. So we're going to talk about how somebody becomes the bank. Why do you want to become the bank? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and we'll walk through different slides that we have on that, but we like to make this interactive. Uh, this is a collaboration, this is a discussion. It's not just us monologuing up here. Yep. So we want you guys to participate, ask questions. That's how the real learning occurs. Yep. Right. Uh, so Teresa, keep your mic on. We'll be coming to you. Yep, yep, yep. So, okay, we've got some intros that just occurred. Again, I think some people, we've got some legal stuff here. Hey, we're not accountants, we're not attorneys, right? Like, you know, this information, take it at face value and do your own due diligence. Always, if you're going to invest with anybody in this room, make sure that you do your own due diligence. Okay. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. So, with that, we're talking about lending, right? Yeah. Uh, and we're, I, I want to talk about this in the context of working with another investor that maybe you've met, because this is a discussion for people who maybe. Uh, know a little bit about how investing works and maybe have made a couple of bucks here and there, uh, but haven't already started lending money to people, right? So how would you get started if you know how the business works and you have the ability to help someone else get their deal done? What next? What do you do to uh, protect yourself, to make a good return, to understand what the terms are, right? So that's the, the discussion. Uh, and what I think we like to just generally start with is just to remind people that they can lend money, right? Yeah. You, you can literally be your own personal bank, right? We want you to, I mean, the goal is to become the bank. One of the goals should be to become a bank. And many times people think that being the bank is risky, right? It's like, oh, I'm lending money on this project. It's risky, but it's actually the safest place to be when you actually know what you're doing, when you understand values, when you understand cost. It is the safest place to be. And typically the rehabber is the one that's taking the majority of the risk right. in that. That's right. You keep talking. So, uh, yeah, so we've got some slides that kind of talk about the, the ways in particular that we uh, try to understand and mitigate that risk like Rob was talking about, to try to put as much of the risk as possible onto the borrower where it should be, the person who brought in the deal. Hopefully they're making uh, the vast majority of the money on the deal and the project, but as the person funding a certain percentage of that deal, we have to protect ourselves, right? Uh, so the the general kind of structure for private lending is much the same, if not identical, to what you might be used to uh, if you borrowed money from any other traditional source, like a traditional bank on your normal 30 year loan for your house. You've got some paperwork to sign. You promise certain things. You give people certain rights to do things. If you don't do what you said you're going to do. So it kind of works like that. Uh, but there are some important ways that it's not the same as a traditional bank kind of money. I'm killing your slides here. You no, know, you're not. You actually, this is a great time. Okay. I happen to know what these slides say. So uh, one of the most important aspects of private lending is to know that when we say private lending, we're talking about essentially a commercial loan, a loan for a commercial purpose to a person who is borrowing my money to invest in something and hopefully earn a return on it. Uh, you are not making a mortgage here. We're not mortgage brokers. We're not making a mortgage for someone's uh, home to live in, right? That is a very important distinction. You cannot lend money to a stranger for them to buy a property and live in. You need licenses for that. If you're even gonna put people in touch with other people to do that, you need a, a mortgage broker's license. So uh, one very important distinction uh, right off the bat is when you uh, become a private lender, you are making commercial loans and all of your paperwork references such. Uh, so understand that while the paperwork may look very similar, uh, just don't start a discussion with someone uh, who says, oh, hey, yeah, I'm looking to borrow some money. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of money. Hey, Rob, would you lend me some money for uh, my my house, my house? The answer is unfortunately no, unless anyone else here knows any differently uh, about any other loophole for lending to someone on their personal residence. I am not aware of any loophole around that. Uh, that you mortgage. mortgage. Yeah. So what we have been really is a, a person-to-person -person, uh, individual 
agreement, really, right? Uh, I'm making you a loan for your business. It just happens to be secured by a piece of real estate. Part of the paperwork goes towards that security and, and how I get that security as the lender on your real estate. But this is a business loan. This is a business transaction. So that's another thing. Uh, needs to be as such. You need to be having those kind of conversations with your potential. Well, let me ask you something real fast. Teresa, why do you like this business? Why do you like the lending business? Um, when it goes well, <laughs> it's very lucrative. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, you know? okay. So let's let's go there. I mean, it's the it's the ultimate passive investment. You but literally it can go south, right? In yeah. what instances can something like this go south? Say that again. In what instances can it go south? Like I, I just that's, got that's a discussion for the next hour. In every way, shape, or form <laughs> that you can possibly imagine, it can go south. From simple things. Such as uh, they, you know, that you're, they just, they just blow the project, to um, they die. Mm -hmm. I, I had, I had a borrower die. Holy from smokes! COVID, from COVID. Wow. Uh, yeah. Hello. There's, there's no time like the present. How do you unwind that? Was your borrower an LLC? Uh, my borrower was a lot of things <laughs> but the bottom line is after attorneys and a year and the state work and all the rest of it his uh his estate ended up with so many people going after him and so many of his projects in the middle or just beginning it just was a timing thing that his estate had 13 dollars left in it so that is that's not that's not after your first position on the real estate though is it that's uh, before I got a dime. So I lost I lost all the money on that loan. So is there kind of a quick and dirty on how you might avoid that? You know, you just, it was one of the early loans I made and uh, I did not have the proper contracts in place. Um, uh, the good documents in place. I did not have great legal counsel. Uh, I did not have enough due diligence. I used TransUnion and others to do a check on him, and it didn't catch tax liens and other things that the guy had on him, and I can't even fathom. But, you know, later in my career, I do all those steps now and would, would catch all the things that ended up being surprises to everybody, including the guy's parents and business partner. Gotcha. Uh, because obviously we we can't control people's lives, their lifespan, right? That right. could that could happen right. to anyone. Right. Uh, but my understanding is, if you're in the correct position on your loan, there are usually fairly few things that can end up in front of you, right? Uh, if you're yeah. aware of them in the beginning. So isn't it, it's all, it's all about first position versus second position. I, right. I was up until two years ago, primarily a second position lender. And that's, yeah. that's, you know, let's face it. That's a, it's a huge risk. Even when you do everything right, it's a huge risk. The bottom line is if you're going to do it, you have to understand that should something dramatic happen, the first position lender is going to get paid and you will not. Probably. Yeah. That's just so bottom line of that. That's a reality. And yeah, this guy, this guy and I, by the way, did like six loans and he paid all the other five back. Yeah. So okay. it, it was it was kind of a wash at the end of the day, unfortunately. I made a lot of money from him, but having defaulted after he died on that one loan, it was all kind of zeroed out. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's a business lesson in that because I remember one of the the, the biggest pains that I ever had was with a contractor that I'd done maybe 20 renos on and then it was like number 21 and that's when it went south and it went south really bad and I because you're in you're doing business with people and the first 20 go well you, you start cutting corners a little bit and you, mm -hmm. you don't look 
you know, at the project as often, you give a little bit more leeway. And then the next thing you know, we're, you know, a hundred thousand dollars over budget. And you're, I'm like, what happened? I had to get them off the project. So there is a business lesson in that. It's like each project is its own individual and you, you, you're always verifying all yep. the information. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's quoted way too much in in all things, but this is the the best quote there's ever been from uh, any politician. Our, our good friend Ronnie Reagan told us, "Trust but verify." Right? Yeah. Uh, always, always verify. Uh, so let's get into that as quickly as we can uh, in the ways that hopefully we protect ourselves from that same position. Uh, but just uh, real quick, the the other thing about being a lender is. For me personally, it seems to make the most sense to approach lending after I've done a few deals, right? Because these kind of things that we're talking about, you need to know when a deal just smells bad, right? Yeah. Preferably before you're in it. And the only way to really know if your deal smells bad, if you've got a dodgy contractor or a, a bad neighborhood or a sketchy underfunded borrower is to have avoided being those people yourself by doing a deal, right? Yeah. Learn what a bad contractor looks like, hopefully by avoiding them in the first place, or know what it means to be properly funded to do your deal because you've had to do one, right? Uh, so that you're knowing what to look for. So you make sure they have the proper insurance. Make sure you verify they have the insurance. Look them up on Deport. Like, right. There's you, like all these things you can do to protect yourself. That's right. And we're here to be as helpful as we can, not as your attorney, but we can refer to you to people who are and tell you the things to look out for, but nothing beats experience, right? This is your money you're lending. So know what could possibly go wrong with the person and the deal. And then once you have a pretty good understanding of that for having done it a couple of times, then maybe consider uh, lending money to other people. So my, my rule for a person looking to lend is, Let's just say you're independently wealthy. And by the way, it leads to our last point here. That did you know that you can lend your money from your uh, IRA? We'll talk about it another night, how to set up a self-directed IRA that lets you do this. But if that's where the majority of your capital is, you can use it to make really good returns by lending it to people. Uh, but I would take my retirement money and start lending it to someone for a rehab deal if I'd never at least just partnered with someone on it, take six months, find somebody, if you've got money and they've got deals, hey, look, I will pay for everything and give me half. That's the pretty standard split, right? I bring the money, you bring the deal, and we split it. Whatever the, the split is, take 10%, take 25%, but get into a deal or two, have them go through their process, and then approach and lending, right? Yeah. And, then, and then start talking about uh, lending. So that's the point being made by life. So what are the things then that that we need to understand uh, as someone who's going to lend money to someone? How about how to determine a reasonable safe ARV? Yeah. Kind of important? After repair value for those that are just new and learning on it. So you need to know what something is worth once it's fixed up. All right. And who do you think is going to be more aggressive on what they think a property is going to be worth when it's done? You as the deal maker or me as the lender? I'm going to be more aggressive as the deal maker. Right? I'm optimistic. That's right. It's going to sell for this amount. That's right. right. We we right. go into these things thinking we're going to get rich, right? That's that's why you go uh, into we're optimists. Rehabs. We're optimists yeah. by nature, right? Your job as a lender, though, is to be a cautious optimist yeah. or a realist. A realist, you want to right? Be a realist. Uh, because it's about protecting. Uh, your loan first, and then making a reasonable return. You're going to look at it through an objective lens, you know, and you're 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 going to be cautious, right. cautiously optimistic. So there's there's usually there's often some back and forth a in gap. in discussion about what this deal is going to be worth when you, Mr. Investor, are done fixing it up and selling, it. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, obviously, you. You need to do what you need to do to get your deal done as a lender to help this person get their deal done. If you say it's worth so little that there's no money left to be made in it, then you shouldn't make the loan and they shouldn't do the deal. But realistic optimism is, is what we're looking for here, right? So I don't, as a lender, bet on the 
highest price ever achieved in the neighborhood ever, even if my borrower is a phenomenal rehabber and they know what they're doing. Why would you need to take that risk? Why should you take that? Yeah, risk? You don't, you don't, you, you, um, you know, I find that most times people, when they're looking at and they're trying to figure out their ARVs, they they don't take the full picture in. You know, price is always a function of three things. Condition, location, and the time of the year. Well, I should say four things. And supply and demand, right? But condition, location, and the time of the year. And when we say location, it's not just the neighborhood or you, not just Federal Street, right? It's where on Federal Street? What is it back to on Federal Street? What is it, what's the neighbor like on Federal Street, right? People don't take that into account. Like a house in a neighborhood sells for more in the cul-de-sac versus, you know, towards the mouth of that street. So you you have to be able to factor that in. And many times when people are pulling cops, they're like, look at this sale. It's my identical property. and uh, I'm like, yeah, but that one's at the end of the cul-de-sac and yours is not. It's on a double yellow. Right. Uh, first I had a house in Silver Spring and these are new uh, uh, rehabbers and uh, they, they were excited about the ARV. Plus, those were, and they had a strict budget down. There was only one thing that they were missing. All the other comps had basements. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they compared all the above ground but they didn't realize yeah, yeah. So they were trying to unload it on Facebook. They were like, "Please, anyone, take this out." We yeah, know that we're not going to get it. They they looked at the comps and they and they didn't factor in that all of them had basements, but the one that they bought, right? Big mistake. But it happens. I mean, I bought a house earlier this year where I factored in, and luckily it worked out for me because the market is so hot. But mine was the only one that didn't have a deck, and every other house had a deck. And then I realized, oh shoot. Mine doesn't have a debt. That's twenty five thousand yeah. right there. Luckily, I got the highest sale in the neighborhood because we underpriced it, which created a, a demand, right? And we staged the heck out of it and marked through the renovation, so it looked gorgeous. And and we'll come back to this also. Or maybe we can talk about it now. As a lender, you are oftentimes your deal maker's best friend and check on a deal. Yeah. One of the reasons you didn't maybe catch that deck bit is because you didn't probably spend quite enough time in around whatever the house because you didn't have anyone else you were responsible to for the money on that deal but yourself was my right one. yeah where if it were the lender's money they would say well let me at least maybe see some photos of this house first oh did you know it doesn't have a deck right so those are those are things that as an experienced lender, I'm going to be looking for photos, a walkthrough. Someone ought to go check this property out before you stroke the check, whether it's you or someone who works for you. So right. we, we become right. partners. Exactly. We were talking about this, right? You become a partner, essentially, with your lender. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. And, and your lender, if they have done all these things and know all this stuff, is going to be a great partner to uh, a rehabber. That's why I, I tell people that you know, part of the cost is obviously for borrowing the money. But the other thing you're paying wisdom. for is what's, what's up here, what yeah. what I can keep you from doing that I did that cost money. That thousands money. of transactions where you're just, your mind's a calculator. It just like knows you thousands of situations, thousands of, of deals, thousands of properties that we've looked at. And you're like, you're paying for all of that knowledge and it comes out in like a split second and people don't fully appreciate all, you know, everything that happens. So, so you're, you're a check on these things. So these are the things that you want to know. Yeah. Uh, as the lender, this is one of the big ones people mess up how to estimate rehab costs. Yep, right. Yep, everybody in the country except again. Well, I was also going to buy up the warranty. I turned out that the well was on the biggest property, and mm -hmm. we had done a survey, we wouldn't have known that. And um, when you buy in the country, that. you you need to get you need to get a uh, survey for sure. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, and, and I hope uh, anyone who's not here could hear that. A really good point Chad was, was just making outside of the city limits when these are not water and sewer uh, properties whole different set of things that you need to understand and consider and know the potential cost of well and septic on a house being the the big ones the big one. uh, so yeah that goes into understanding what it costs to renovate whatever it is you've got wherever it is it's located 
uh, and whatever attachments it has to it, you feel like you need it on it. Pull and review a credit report uh, sounds fundamental, but do not give anyone money without pulling their credit. Uh, we tell people that your credit isn't the most important thing in the deal. If you've got a good deal, you should be able to get funded for it, but it's still a thing. Uh, everyone's going to have their own risk tolerance. You as a lender are going to have to determine what your personal tolerance for risk is and what you deem to be a risky loan. But I can tell you if it's the first time you're going to do it, why not start with somebody who's got a proven track record of paying other people back? And if they've established a track record of not paying other people back, maybe don't make that the first person you give money to. Right? If somebody wanted to get full credit, Thomas, like, what's the easiest way? Can they con like, can they just, yeah, you'll pull just okay. So put your info in the chat because you'll, okay. So Thomas can run credit for somebody. Credit, background, criminal. Is the credit, background, criminal, easy to do. Which is why a Thomas needs to be in your Rolodex, right? As a property manager, this is the kind of stuff he does all day long. He's looking for sketchy people that you don't want to trust, right? <laughs> uh, for landlords, exact same kind of discussion you need to have before lending them uh, money. So people like Thomas are key to be in your uh, sphere. Can I can I ask Teresa a question? Mm -hmm. Right. So Teresa, you found out that your client your your client uh, owed money to the IRS, right? Yeah. If you had done a search, like how would you have found that out? So I did do a search. Um, I used TransUnion because um, a lot of investors were using that, and they let me use their account. And some people I know who had insurance companies let me use that. A uh, bunch of stuff that he ended up having did not show up on that. So now I use a lawyer. <laughs> and the lawyer goes into LexisNexis and a few other sources. And for whatever reason, I can't explain it, they are able to pull up a lot more information. In fact, we, we ran something about a year ago on the guys, uh, another guy, just for me to check the TransUnion report I run, and I do credit, criminal, legal, background, everything. I, I do every one of them, and if you you don't want me to do that, then I don't need to give you my money. So, uh, yeah, right? Like, it's just like your property management. You don't need to live here. Go live someplace else. So, um, and I did that for years because I did have rent, quite a few rentals. I had five rentals, and I used to do a, a check on every one of them, and that taught me a lot because, you know, people who on paper – you would not believe for a second what comes out of a credit report on them. You know, people who have high level jobs here are the pastors of their church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden they've got bankruptcies in Florida and bad checks in California. And they've left a wake over their life of hit and runs all over the place. And it's just, it's astounding. So um, I'm sure someone here knows better what great the great credit report companies are. As again, I use TransUnion, and I just did not find that they um, that they they found everything there was on people. And to your point about going through an attorney, that's another person that needs to be uh, in your sphere, right? The, on your dream team of people you're in routine contact with. You mentioned LexisNexis. That is the system whereby you can look up active court cases once it's already been adjudicated and whatever right. has happened has happened if you have a judgment declared against you that ends up on a credit report but until you get to that point only usually only an attorney can find out what's active in the courts currently that you may be involved in good reason maybe to uh, have an attorney by the way an attorney's gonna be drafting your docs for you anyway so you can't do this without a good real estate attorney how do we get access to Alexis nicest <laughs> I really don't know. If you're that concerned about lending to someone, we work with them. Oh, no, no, dude, 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 dude. You just heard Teresa say, right. right, that this person had, you know, all sorts of things that didn't come up in the like, I have a hard time lending right now. He's loaned me. He does all my phone calls, all yep. the I can't, I can't, if any, when anybody speaks from your, off, from your room, oh. I can't hear him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I have a hard time lending now. He's very big in the area. He never runs anyone's credit. He doesn't yeah. even ask how much money you have in the account. He lends you the money. And it, he has to take backups. But maybe because he has contracts on the payroll, and it's 
ballot. So, so what do we get right now? Yeah, Jed, Jed is saying that, that he's currently got a relationship with a lender where he doesn't even do credit checks, much less uh, run like criminal backgrounds and LexisNexis and that kind of thing, uh, which I completely and fully believe we have those relationships too. Question is, did you have that on the first deal you did? Yeah, but that's unusual. That's actually dumb on his part. So <laughs> that, you know, that's great. That is great for you. I think that if you buy it 65 cents on the dollar, I think you think that either you can do it and you can't, then I'll just take it myself. And by the way, that is 100% true. Yeah. Done correctly in first position, Do does it matter if you have 200 credit? Not really. Does it matter if you're involved in other lawsuits? Maybe not. But what it will probably do is make it take longer. That, the, to likely, get my money. the likelihood of that project going south is super high, right? Correct. Correct. Because it's an irresponsible person who's just not going to be able to get that project done. Maybe, all about one time. Maybe they had a divorce. Maybe they're like, like 100, sure, 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. 
the on loan that have better credit than the primary person is absolutely negotiable. So structuring payments, we'll talk about that. Okay. So that's stuff you think. Um, how does the loan process work for real estate? Really fairly simple. There's only a couple of document sets uh, that get signed. The first one is the commercial promissory note. And these things may vary a little by state as to what they're called, but the functions are mainly the same. So our promissory note just kind of defines the terms of the loan. How much am I giving you? What interest rate am I charging you for the money? What are the repayment terms? When do you need to pay me back? What happens if you need more time? Do I get to decide to give you more time? What happens if you don't pay me back on time, if you default on our loan? Uh, and one of the more important ones, who's guaranteeing this loan, right? Uh, this is a commercial loan, right? So in the commercial lending space, um, there is oftentimes what's known as a non-recourse loan where the person who signs up on behalf of an entity or LLC or whatever, signing for the loan isn't necessarily responsible or isn't absolutely responsible to pay it back. It's called non-recourse. The deal is paying this loan. If the deal makes money, great. Everybody's happy. Uh, if not, don't look to me. I'm just running this thing here. I just signed for it. Uh, what's really mind expanding about real estate is where you see that most often is on really large deals, right? If you earn the right to walk into the room with a bunch of bankers and say, I'm going to turn this corner uh, in this neighborhood into 500 condos and 40,000 square feet of retail space. You are more likely to get a loan that if it all goes pear-shaped, you don't have to pay back. Versus if you just come to a couple of uh, uh, individual investor type guys and say, hey, I want to uh, tear up this you know, $200,000 townhouse. I'm going to make sure you're credit worthy. And if you can't uh, make a good deal, that you'll eventually pay me back if it takes you to, to your 100. It's just kind of, just one of those yeah, things that as you look at other ways to invest and other ways to be active in real estate, non-recourse is a thing that you can, can get into and you will see more for bigger projects than what we're talking about. Our loans and what I recommend. going to be recourse. All recourse all loans. Recourse. Someone is signing, promising to pay. That's the promise part of the promise right now. Promising to repay. And if they don't, they personally, Our after life. this deal is gone, still has to pay the money. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. pretty straightforward. So that's the promise you make a promise over here. Then you have the commercial loan agreement. That is what makes this the commercial nature, right? It's the thing that says, I'm giving you this money so that you can purchase a property, hold it for some limited period of time that we all agree to, sell it, get what you're going to get out of it, and then give me my money back. And then see my promissory note for what happens if you don't do those things. But this is what makes it clear that I am not a mortgage broker. This is not a mortgage, this is just a loan, and it happens to be secured by a piece of real estate that I get the right to if you don't give me my money back. But that's not the, the biggest part. Like I, can lease you money. Yeah. I can lend you money on your car. You yeah. can buy a car with it, and I would say, well, I get the car. And that happens too. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can do that. I'm not an auto lender, though, so I don't know for sure. But for real estate, you can lend somebody money. And let the that's money. That's repo, right? It's like, that's what happens with repo. That's exactly what happens. All right, so here's the last bit. Uh, so we're talking about the protection bit, right? So you're going to pay me back. And if you don't pay me back, what happens? The last and perhaps most important uh, document you sign is the deed of trust. Better referred to maybe as a deed of I don't trust you because this is the thing that says, if you don't do what you said you would do in the commercial note and the promissory agreement, this person over here, guy X, will be named in this deed of trust, the trustee who is acting on my behalf as the lender and is always an attorney. It's an attorney. This person has the right to pursue you in court for the taking back of the property. That's the big difference in this kind of loan versus me just giving you some money and saying, do whatever you want with it. Hope you make some, some money and give it back. We maintain as lenders foreclosure rights. And that's where it is exactly the same as you may have heard or if you were around in 2008, the foreclosures happening all over the place, it's the same process. If you don't pay off your loan or you don't meet any of the terms of your loan, your lender, through this deed of trust, has the right, through the attorney that they've named in that deed of trust, to go to the court, say, hey, court, look, here are the terms. They're supposed to pay on X date. They didn't do it. I get the property. 
I say, yep, we see what happens. Uh, that's, they didn't pay it back. So on X date, depends on where you're lending and what else your borrower has done to slow or speed up the process. We'll talk about a couple of things you can do to speed up the process, but somewhere within, you know, a couple of weeks to a couple of months, if you're in the Northern Virginia area, you've got good tight docs. Uh, you can be on a courthouse staff, just like you saw back in 2008, nine, hammer goes down. Who wants to buy this thing? Going once, going twice. And if someone offers enough money that it pays you back everything that you are owed, great, they buy it. If not, you own the property, just like a bank takes properties back in foreclosure, right? So that foreclosure process uh, is given to you by the deed of trust. So that's a very important document that your real estate attorney Let's jump in. Who's anybody have questions so far? Remember, this is this is the more interactive you are, the more learning actually occurs. So if anybody have a question? Room, Mike, you got a question? No questions? Okay. So, so yeah. Promissory note, commercial loan agreement, deed of trust. One of the three big documents that you have. So the real estate attorney is the one who is going to draft all these documents for you, right? Don't go to, I don't want to mention any internet legal services. Don't go to some internet legal service. Don't get one off of Google. Don't get one from me. Have a real estate attorney who works exclusively for you draft these documents. And guess what? It'll cost a couple thousand dollars. And guess what's even better? Your borrowers don't pay for it. They yeah. want your money. Yeah, Every right. single time uh, you go to actually close on this loan and give your borrower their money at the table, there will be a line item on the HUD for the legal services provided to me as the lender. You as the borrower pay that cost. And lender title insurance, okay. And, and all the other good things that protect the person with the loan, right? The yeah, lender's title insurance and appraisal and, and inspections and anything else that you negotiate uh, that protection. Or of course, the of course the borrower will pay for that. But they want the money. Think of it, you know, great documents like in Teresa's case are just it's it's an insurance vehicle, right? So the good news is that. The borrower is paying for that insurance, so don't skimp on this. But you, you, you want to make sure that you. And how, by the way, and how do you find a good attorney? How do you know, right? It's the network, right? You, you ask people in the network, like Teresa, like Mark. Who do they use? And then they're going to give you a referral to somebody that's just done this all the time. Look right? for the Facebook group for any of those that aren't already a member, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, go to the, investor, uh, go to the Facebook group. On the Facebook group, you have yeah. to go to the group, not the page, right? Special group. Has to be let in, completely free. Uh, but it is for the group, so we kick you out if you get spammy. That's why all the content there is really good. Not a bunch of people spamming, spamming garbage. It's people that say, hey, I'm looking for a good real estate attorney in Baltimore. You'll get a couple of referrals for people who have used people that they like. Yeah. It's a great system. I saw a great question the other day on cabinets. Where do you get the cabinet yeah. stuff, right? So it's yeah. good. Okay. really, really good conversation happening. So that lender safety net then uh, is provided by that need of trust that lets you go through the foreclosure process to say, if you can't pay me back, a judge gets to put it out on the auction steps. And if I can get paid back there, great. If I can't, I now own the property. Thank you. Uh, so, and by the way, after you own the property, you can sell it, right? So I now own it. I can do whatever I want with it. Finish the rehab, sell it the way it is, turn it into a rental. Uh, you can. That's why it your to do renovations ahead of time, so you understand. Okay, if I take this property back, what am I going to do with? It? That's right, and and not only that, what is the property worth at any given moment in time, right? Because it's always being worked on. My borrower is always out there doing something with the money I gave them. Hopefully, putting it into the house. But by the way, we don't trust that either. And you don't give them all the money up front. I'll talk about that in a second. But that is a thing that you also need to know because at any given time, if they expire or retire or fly to Bermuda, you need to know what that property is worth when you take it back so that hopefully it is always worth more than what you lent on it so you get all of your money. So, key point. I remember that during the foreclosure crisis, I sat down with this lender. I had just done a, a, a rehab in Riverdale in Maryland, right? And this was uh, oh, 10 years ago, maybe long, no, it was longer. It was like 13, 14 years ago. And this title company, they'd gone into the lending business. And what they were doing was that they were lending not only the uh, acquisition of the asset, 
but they were lending the renovation money as well. And that was the piece that got them in the trouble. When the market crashed, they were literally extended because they, they had essentially gone, you know, way above what they should have on this. So instead of being, being at a 65 LTV, they were pretty much lending at like 85, 90 LTV. They were like, we'll give you all of it. And then the market dipped 20%. And they were left holding the bag. And a lot of these people, what were happening were they, as soon as the market started sliding, they were they weren't putting the money into the market, into the asset. They just took the money and ran. So this this family title company that had that had worked for like 30 years to amass like a ton of money lost the majority of all of it during the financial crisis. Because it worked really well for the first 300 deals. I know right now it's starting to be bad. Her, her partner basically she put up all the money. Her partner has walked away because she you want to you want to come up here just so that you can hear. So he's saying that there's a partner, a lender that in Culpepper that has struggled really hard, and he's about to kind of share the story. And so this is good because people learn through this. So, so the person was out of Maryland, and this lady reached out to her, and she said to her, you know, I will do all the work. We'll buy two homes. And um, once we buy the two homes, um, I will do all the work and we'll split the profits 50-50. So the work gets started and the lady's not licensed and they get a stop work order on the house. And she can't figure out how to remove the stop work order because they don't, they haven't, the structure of the place, the beams aren't done properly, the spacing of the four by fours isn't done. So the partner that was supposed to do all the work, you know what she's done? No. She said, um, I'm out of here, but it gets better. She has now put a lien on the property for the work that she has done incorrectly. Mm, I've seen that happen multiple times, actually. Okay, so here's a person who doesn't even want the house that lives close to Maryland. For a lady that she thought that she was doing a favor, you know, and this lady's like all over Facebook and blah, 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 you know what I mean? And so everyone thought, oh, this lady must be a genius investor, you know? So, so not only that, and in Virginia, there's no due process. Like you just put a lien on a, a mechanics lien on a property. Yeah. You know what I mean? And on that. So, so here the lady is, she's calling me and messaging me, the investor out of Maryland. Like, who do you know? Who do you know in Culpepper that can come and get the stop work order removed? And, and what can we do? Can I wholesale it? Well, that's a good point. Like that your contractor is probably one of the most important relationships that you can have because they can completely trust you, right? The project looks good on paper. And then the contractor completely screws it up, takes too long, doesn't get permits. You're a rookie person. You don't know. You didn't know they need full permits. And you got to go back, tear it out, fix it up. You lost months. And then you just end up losing. Rob, it gets better than that. The inspector is asking for a structural engineer because they don't know how the ceiling is being held up. Yeah. That's how bad it is. And then the woman, instead of apologizing to the investor who this lady, she suckered in, Instead of saying, I'm sorry for wasting all your time and now we're not going to do, she's now filed a mechanic's lien on the property. Yeah. For, and she's not even a licensed contractor. How can a non licensed contractor file a mechanic's lien on the property? There's a difference between attempting and succeeding. Right? So that sounds like that's maybe an attempt that might not succeed uh, in collections, but it still holds things up. So we got some questions here, right? Mm -hmm. What's the foreclosure process in VA? VA is each area different. I'm new here in Texas. If the property sells for over the foreclosure amount, the lender gets to keep the balance. In Ohio, the balance goes to the borrower. Um, and then Andrew said, you can file a suit against someone for filing a false lien, FYI. Yeah. Good, good to know. Correct. There you go. So just because someone can doesn't mean that they'll be uh, successful, but it can slow you down. So to get back to that question about things that can slow you down, uh, Thomas might be a good resource for this because you deal with uh, landlord things a lot. Uh, Maryland versus Virginia versus DC, which is the most landlord friendly of the jurisdictions? Virginia, right? Easily. Uh, and much the same way, uh, Virginia is far more lender friendly than Maryland and DC. Um, you are allowed more, protect more, more protection and a more protracted process as the borrower in other nearby jurisdictions here, being Maryland and DC, than you are in Virginia. So that couple of weeks to couple of months, I was saying in Virginia, can be several months uh, 
pretty easily in Maryland and several years in DC, depending on the situation, indefinite uh, in DC under the right circumstances, depending on uh, how savvy your borrower is and how perhaps weak your uh, documents might be. So that is a thing to be aware of. You do need to be aware of the laws and local jurisdiction in which you are lending the money. It just matters where the property is. It matters where you sign the paperwork, usually, although some of your paperwork can try to get around some of those things too. Let's, let's, the let's make sure. Here, here's what I want people to hear because we're talking about a lot of like the scary stuff. People on here are going, oh my God, I never want to be a lender after this. If you do everything right and it's not hard to do it right and you bring in professionals on the front end, it will save you a lot of heartache on the back end. And being a lender is such a great place to be, especially if you know values and you know what things cost and you understand like what an exit is if you do have to take back the asset, right? And I think this is why Mark said, do some deals and then you start like feeling it out, like what 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 a good lender looks like, what a good contractor looks like, what a good rehabber looks like, and then and then lend money from your self directed IRA or, you know, wherever. Yeah, none of these things necessarily have to take you out as the lender. They can just slow you down. So you just kind of need to be aware of them. And then just to your point, it gets back to if this is the first time you're going to do it, then maybe set yourself up for success and check credit and lend in a lender friendly jurisdiction right don't take unnecessary risks until you're prepared for them funded to withstand them and willing to deal with them right so you're right it, it's a it's a beautiful thing to do uh just do it smart so yeah that's, that's the point so let's talk about that then so i uh, we, we talked about the stuff that can go wrong what's all the really good stuff that goes right and great about lending uh, the biggest thing is the return on your capital. Uh, we we talk about this when we talk earlier in the year about how to get your deal done as the investor, but the short of it is you're usually not going to walk into a you know brick and mortar bank on the corner where the big guys say, "Hey, give me some money to go buy this smelly molded up house, uh, fix it up, and put it back on the market in six months, and hopefully get all of your money paid back." By the way, when all that works out, I'm going to pay your cheap you know regular lender rate back in six months, you're going to make you know, $2,000 on your half a million dollar loan. No, they're going to say no, because that's not the business they're in. And they're smarter than that. That is why private money exists, because they're not going to get these loans from a traditional bank. So the terms are going to be a little different because we are lending predominantly on the asset where credit counts, but mostly what counts is that you, investor, borrower, have a good deal. And I think that you're going to make money and I'll make my money, so I'm willing to go in with you like a partner on this deal. Yeah, and there's a different level of risk, right? So there's renovation risk that occurs, and so they're going to charge you in this market anywhere between 8 and 10% and 1 and 3 points, depending on your level of expertise, depending on uh, your relationship with somebody. Um, so, and, and as a lender, it's a, it's a great return, especially if you, you're well-known and you could put that message out there, the deals just start coming to you, right? And then you have the ability to say, yes, no, yes, no. Uh, but even today, it's competitive as a lender, right? There's a lot of lenders that are out there that are willing to cut corners to get the deal, right? They're willing to say, hey, no credit check, no background check uh, to get the deal. And, you know, it'll work until it doesn't. And then you're like, what? what? Just like, yeah, you mentioned it worked until it didn't. It, it worked until it, yeah, works, right? Works until, until it doesn't. doesn't. So yeah. you, you'll get to determine your own personal risk profile. Yeah. But the things that you should be charging are that 8 to 12 or more or less, whatever you negotiate. There's no rule here. Private commercial loans are not subject to usury laws. It's whatever interest rate you negotiate, whatever amount of funding points, right? One point is 1% of the total loan. Uh, your loan to value, loan to ARV is one of the most important figures and calculations to know. How much of the total when it's finished and fixed up and looking pretty and ready to sell, value of the property, am I willing to lend against today when it's not pretty and it's ugly and smelly and moldy and still needs work done to it? So that's why we figure out first what that reasonable you might call it conservative, but good, safe ARV on the property is. 
and I'm going to lend you a percentage of that maximum. And it depends on the loan balance, right? Is 70% on a $100,000 loan very different than 70% on a million dollar loan, right? So meaning Correct. you might you might be a little bit more aggressive and say, I'm only gonna lend 50, a 50 LTV on a $100,000 asset, right? Just because your margin there is, there's a little bit more risk that's involved. Right. Right. Yes, question. So the 70% loan to value, is that the same for commercial rental properties or multi-family residents? No, that's the, so his question, what, go ahead, repeat the question. Yeah, so you're, you're asking if the terms that you would see when we're saying 70% loan to ARV value are the same as the terms that would discuss would be discussed if you were borrowing for a, a multifamily or commercial property. Um, yes and no. Loan to value is loan to value, right? So it's what is the value of this asset when it's ready to go on the market? And then however much I'm willing to give you of that amount is the loan to value. There are plenty of other things though that get considered for a larger commercial multi-tenant or different use case kind of property. Again, not really germane to this discussion, how you evaluate a storage facility or an apartment building or an office building, right? The beauty of residential real estate is I always have a pretty fundamental understanding having looked back at 150 years of real estate history in this country of roughly what's going to happen to property value for residential real estate at you know, any given time, whether things are going really well, okay, or like unimaginable disaster like 2008. And maybe not everybody planned for unimaginable disaster of 2008. Those would have been 40 to 50% LTV loans at maximum if you knew that was coming. But whatever your, your loan to value maximum is, is that protection that you're going to have as the lender for if things change and values go and down. These are very short term, six month loans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Set short term loans. Yeah, that's the other thing. Usually your loan term is much longer for so the number the refi cash out in the day. So, no, no not on refi, on just sell. So, okay. Just sell. Well, right? this is most people fix and flip. What, what we're talking about are terms rate, fix and flip, borrow it. You have your townhouse in you know, Northern Virginia, fix it up in two or three months, put it on the market for a month, and then get your money back. You make your money, you pay me back, everybody's happy. However, you could do a burr. You can, as a as a lender, lend on other kinds of property. You could lend to someone to fix a house up to rent. Remember, just as long as they're not living in it, other people can live in it if they own it as an investment property, uh, as long as they're not in it. Uh, but for for the purposes of this discussion and these times, this is typical to- The majority of them are fix and flip, but there are a number of lenders now that have come out with uh, products that convert over to long-term buy and hold products. After you renovate the asset, the interest rate's higher. It's a, just a, it's, a diff, it's a higher interest rate. And it's typically geared towards a person that's got a lot of assets already, so they're not qualifying for your Fannie or Freddie type of loan, right? Because you've got the maximum amount of, of 10 assets. Right. And then you could 10 in my name, 10 in my wife's name, total 20. And so to that point, like say you your borrower is a buy and hold investor and they've maxed out all of the other. They can't get a traditional second home or, or uh, income property loan. You can still lend to them under these terms and say hey, you've got six months, fix it up, put a tenant in it, rent it out and then go to a bank and get a regular commercial loan from them. I don't care what happens in six months, as long as I'm paid back, wherever you get the money to pay me back, you can get it from, but it's a viable strategy to use my money for six months to get it fixed and get it rental occupied, and then get someone else's stabilized asset money at probably less than eight to 12% interest, yeah, right? Hopefully 3.25 yeah. or, you know, three and a half percent. You, you may be able to get probably a, a less expensive loan, but this a uh, uh, loan is for that most risky period of time when the house is ugly and it needs work and we're uh, working against potential market risk and bad actors and all the stuff that can happen. Right? So that's why uh, you charge what you charge. This is what most everybody uh, charges or more for these loans. And the maximum that 
I, I suggest anyone for the first time to look at lending is no more than 70% uh, loan to value, right? You know, one thing that we haven't talked about, let me just see who's on here real fast. Like the market has shifted a bit since the beginning of the year. Everybody agree? Like anybody on here, you see the market sh has shifted a bit? Okay. So yes. Yes. So the market, so what's happened, yes. So the market was so crazy in the beginning of the year. Then this is normal. Then it always slows down around the summertime. And then there's a little bit of a, a velocity picks back up in the fall, but typically prices down. So you see a bump up in the spring, a little like it falls a little bit in the summer, and then the velocity kicks up a little bit in the fall. And then you see this like up, down, and then like kind of flat, and then up, down, and that's what's happened for some time. So sometimes when you're a lender and you're evaluating assets, you have to be careful that you're looking at, you know, you got to be careful that you're not being tempted by spring comps when it's now summer or fall, right? So, and the market has changed a little bit. You're seeing now decrease in price, decrease in price, decrease in price. When I'm going on the MLS, I get all the alerts. So it's not that the market is like falling or anything. It's just that there's a, season, there's a seasonality effect to it. So you have to pay attention to that as a rehabber and as a lender, right? When you're looking at the comps. Anybody else see anything different out there? I know that this weekend was a big weekend. We, you know, lots of properties went under contract. We saw a lot of properties that were sitting out there go under contract. So it means that the market is still very, very active, right? But it's just a thing to be aware of, right? Yeah. So first time lending, first couple of loans, like if this house is gonna be worth five, $600,000 when it's fixed up, but when you are lending money on it today, you probably shouldn't be into this thing for more than 350, 375, 400 grand. And leave some margin in there. Make sure your borrower has a really good deal. So that they're going to do well. They'll make some money. You'll get your money paid back and everybody's happy. First couple of deals, now it's time to get attached. And they've got to put the skin, the skin in the game. So, so we'll talk about that. Yeah. That, comes, that comes up next. It's probably one of the more important uh, measurements you can have of a viable borrower. Uh, the prepayment of interest is also kind of common. So all that means is I'm going to say of the 12 months that I'm willing to have the money out, uh, four of those interest months, so my loan is costing you $2,000 a month, so $8,000 basically, four months of that interest, we're going to say is going to get prepaid, prepaid at, at the settlement, fund, at settlement table. What does that mean? That just means that's $8,000 less I'm actually giving you, right? Uh, what does that mean? That means that if I'm you lending you money at 12% on uh, $200,000 to $2,000 a month, 200,000 is that's 200, uh, whatever, but get to the math. Point is, whatever you lend, the less you lend, the higher your effective interest rate actually is, right? So if I'm saying there's some holdbacks, you're going to prepay some of my interest, you're going to prepay some of my points. So I know we said I'm lending you 250,000, but I'm only going to actually have to send 220,000, 225, 30,000 to the table because you're prepaying some stuff. We're borrowing on 250, so my interest is on 250, but I'm only sending out 220, 230 because of the prepaid points and interest. Call it dirty pool, call it the, the whatever you want, but it's well, a common the, term. Yeah. Yeah. It's a common term, and it affects right the actual effective interest rate that you make on your money. That is why if you do this on six month terms, and you can, as Rob said, build a a uh, a uh, relationship with people and uh, if you get repeat borrowers and, and come to you frequently and take this money out they do a good job they get this deal done in six months and then go do another deal your annualized rate of return high double digits right can be on the money if you can turn it multiple times at 20 something 25 percent return yeah. in six months so uh it's a very good return on your investment uh so prepayment uh, and then basically anything else that you can negotiate. Some typical terms, uh, one of the most common is construction holdback, right? So today, house is in terrible shape. So my maximum, you're going to sell this house for 600000 We all agree, said and done, easy deal, you'll make your money. Uh, you're buying the house for 300000 and it needs uh, seventy-five grand worth of work. You're going to have your closing costs in and out and all this other stuff. So you're going to need like $100,000 or so to get the deal done, right? So you'll be into it for four, sell it for six, tons of money here to be made. 
if I'm going to lend you a maximum of say $350,000 based on the $600,000 fixed up value, I might not give you all 350 today. I need to make sure that you bring a little bit of money in on day one, get a little bit of work done, get this house closer to the $600,000 value, then I give you a little more. Get a little bit more work done into the house, now get it up to $500,000 in value so that if I had to take it back, right, I'd lent you 325, 330, but if I took it back today, I could sell it for 450, right? This is where that title company got in trouble. They just said, Mark, we've lent you the renovation. I mean, we've lent you the acquisition money. And then they would cut him all of the renovation money on top of it. They weren't verifying the work being done along the way because they got sloppy, lazy. They were making comfortable. They were making a lot of money for a long time. And then boom, the market crashed and hit up. So what construction holdback means is you hold back a certain amount of money until the borrower shows that the work has been done. And an inspector goes out, typically from the title company. Correct. And they'll look at it and they'll say, okay, good. Or sometimes now a lot of lenders are doing Zoom. They're like, walk me through the property and show me that the first phase of the work is done. They look at it. They're like, okay, good. And then they release the funds. And here's a pro tip. Uh, since we we're talking about uh, construction fees, uh, there's a thing called a lien release. That when your contractor gets paid, you can require them to say in exchange for this check that I'm giving you, you're going to sign a lien release saying, I got the money, I'm happy with it, and I am releasing my rights to place the lien on your property in exchange for the money that you just gave. You as the lender, if your borrower or investor didn't know about it, you can say, hey, by the way, why don't you get lien releases from your contractor as you're paying them? Text everybody, lets them say, yep, they paid me, no, no argument, we keep working, but for everything that I've done so far, I've been paid and I cannot follow that lien. Or if I do follow the lien, a judge will throw it out within days because you've got a lien relation. You can say, this guy doesn't vote. I'm going to owe this person this money. So you can ask for that in your in your terms. So anything else we can negotiate? All right. Any questions so far? Well, that no. makes sense. You're like, hey, my guy doesn't even, he just sends me the money, just wires it. No. Yeah. Give me, give me all of them. What happens? Well, there, there are right in the beginning. If you, if you develop a relationship with somebody, like I had a guy that did none of this. He just wired me the money, and they lent me all the renovation money, and that, I just, I did that for years. Well, like, yeah. Sometimes you're rich, my heart. Yeah. So what he's saying is, sometimes it's a curse because. You nobody's checking you. Yeah. Like the nobody nobody's verifying. Yeah. What happens is and nobody goes to see if there's a deck on there's there. check there's yeah, there's 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 checks and balances on this, right? Like a, a good lender is the checks and balances for you, right? Um Which the is? optimist, the realist. That's how you know that's how this relationship works. And, and again, that goes back to how you sell the cost and how you make it valuable to the investor borrower, by the way, I am going to make sure that this deal goes well for you. If it's working for me, then it should work for you. If it doesn't work for me, if it doesn't pass my SNP test, maybe you shouldn't do it. If I turn you down, you maybe shouldn't go borrow somebody else's dumber money, for lack of a better word, and do what is making a bad deal. There's a lot of dumb money out there right now. I mean, there's a lot of people that have a lot of money and they're trying to figure out how do they get a yield in this month, right? Right. A lot of Bitcoin money, right, Mike? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. You got Ether. What's Bitcoin at today? Fifty-six. So it's, what was it's all about that fee. Yeah. It's all about that fee. Anyway, uh, we just don't want that to be you. Yeah. Let people get dumb money wherever they want. They're not getting it. We don't need to go through. So all this is just how the numbers yeah. work. Feel free to take a photo. Yeah. Trust me, the math works. Uh, the returns are good. Uh, you can uh, achieve easily 40, 50 percent annualized rates of return on your money by charging 12 percent for it, a couple of points, making the uh, borrower promise to give it back to you in six months, or you can go after the property and take the property back. Right? Yeah. So, uh, all that does is tell you what uh, the, all that math does is tell you what a borrower would need to bring to do the average deal that a good lender has protected themselves on it. So what that means is, uh, this is uh, there's another uh, argument for um, private money. So 
remember what I said at the beginning, you don't have it, uh, just find somebody to give you the money and split the deal 50-50, that's fine, you can do that. Uh, just know that if you are the person who has the deal, you otherwise have a couple bucks to scrape together and just borrow the money instead of partner with someone. If your deal makes $40,000 and you have to give 20 of it to your partner for providing the money, if you borrow the money, even at 12% and a couple of points and inspection fees and all the other stuff, your hard money loan, your private personal loan, might only cost you $12,000. What makes you more money? 12,000 or 20, right? So these these loans are only expensive when you don't factor when you the fact it, that what else you might be attempted to do. In relative money, terms, right? Relative terms. And most people start off with kind of like, they call it like the elephant and the mouse relationship, right? Or, you know, the bird dog where, hey, you go find the deal, I'll supply the money, we split everything 50-50. And that's a great, that's a great relationship. Uh, but it is an expensive relationship because finding the deal is the hardest part of the whole equation. And there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of money out there for the, for the right deals. Right? So finding the money is never the problem. Right. Finding the deal. Finding the good deal. So that good deal uh, that you're going to buy for $350,000 and sell for six, and it needs your $50,000 worth of paint and carpet and stuff cleaned up, isn't just three fifty plus fifty is the cost, right? You've got closing costs. You've got my interest payments to, to factor in as the borrower. Uh, utility costs, real estate taxes, the cost of clothes and commissions and all those other things. So you need to understand as the lender, in addition to obviously as the borrower, how much cash you actually need to do this deal, right? And again, remember, I'm only going to lend you a maximum of. 65, 70% of that finished house value. If that means that's a maximum of 300,000 and you're buying the house for 350 and you got to put another 50 in it, that difference needs to come from you. Not me as the, as the lender, the borrower, right? They need to have skin, what we call it, um, in the deal. Uh, if you've got a house that's going to sell for a million dollars, and somehow you've come across somebody that has just flat stolen this house. They've got it under contract for $250,000. You can't screw this up uh, in any way. You could lend them 100% of the money and take back this million dollar house at any point and sell it for 600,000 because they just stole it. But for your first loan, still wouldn't do it. Make your borrower bring something. There is yeah. no deal good enough. Our, you know, our boy Richie said, uh, he's like, his number one red flag when lending money is whether or not the person has any cash to put towards the deal. If they don't, then typically he's just going to kind of pass, right? But there's plenty of lenders out there that don't require that. And here's the good, here's the even better news as the, the deal maker. If I've got a house that's worth a million dollars and I've got it under contract for $300,000, but I have no money in the world, I'm just the world's best negotiator and found this incredible deal and got it under contract. Do I have to walk away from it without making any money because I don't have any deal and don't lend me money? Sell, to it? sell me the contract. Show up in January. We'll explain to you what wholesaling is, right? Uh, you can make plenty of money just assigning rights to a thing. And that's what we would tell people. If they came and said, hey, I want to borrow some money to flip this house. I have not a penny to my name, but I've got a good deal. Cool. You're probably not a rehabber yet. You're a wholesaler. Sell that contract, maybe to me, by the way, right? So and maybe instead of lending you money, I just give you a bunch of money today for the rights of that contract and we'll do the deal. Or maybe we partner on it. And that's where you get into that. All right, now I don't have to give up more. I can't just borrow at 12% and it's going to cost me 12 grand in interest. I have to give up half the deal but it's half the deal that you then still get to do if you otherwise don't have Yeah, I mean, what's so cool money. about this is, I was just thinking today, you know, we had a member, uh, a grid member, would come to Reston, like, often. And I remember one day he, he talked about how he uh, assigned one of his contracts for $100,000. And I was like, dude, why do you sell us the contract? I kind of guilted him into it. And he's like, okay, next one, Rob, is yours. And he did. He brought another deal, and I think we paid him a hundred. We paid him a hundred thousand dollars for wow. that that contract, right? Now I think we made eighty thousand. 
Oh, you were going to say like 50. 50. Yeah, okay. like 50. 50. We made 50. Well, that's fine. I'm happy with that. He made 50 grand. 50 grand is 50 grand, right? Well, this year, he, remember, I, I like essentially, I just took over his note and he let me take over his note for a period of time. So I just paid his mortgage payment. I paid him his equity in advance. I gave him the equity that he had assumed, hey, this is what I'm, you know, this is what I'm hoping to get for. I just paid it to him in advance. I then renovated the house, Mark renovated the house. And then I made, I think, 55 or $60,000 and never, never even had to borrow the money, right? I took over the note. So there's lots of creative ways of doing this. This is just how do you become the bank? Because it, it is such a great tool to teach yourself, your family, your friends, because it is relatively safe once you understand all the mechanics. Like you said, the asset's worth six hundred thousand dollars, but you're only going to lend three hundred thousand dollars. Like if something's got to go really, really wrong, and it's typically on the development deals where things go wrong. When people are doing condo conversions, that's that's where things go wrong. An inexperienced investor doing a condo conversion totally screw it up in DC because it takes long. They don't understand how to do it, and yeah. Anyhow, we've seen those go bad, really bad. Yep. So. Your borrower should bring something, something to you, no matter how good the deal is, make the terms such that they have to bring something and then verify they have the something. Uh, don't just take the word for it, ask for a statement with the correct name. If it's an entity, make sure that the person who controls the entity is the same person on the bank account. Check to make sure that that account still has the money in it the day before you actually go to closing, right? Not just two months before. Uh, do the smart things just to make sure that when somebody says, yep, I got the money, or if I don't have the money, here's my partner and they've got the money. Just find out who's got the money and make sure that that person is somehow involved in your deal. I love lending out of my self-directed IRA. So it's a tool. We talk a little bit about how to set up a self-directed IRA. You could be the bank if you've got maybe like a an old 401k that's just sitting out there. You could literally convert that money over to a self-directed IRA. And then you could lend, you know, that money. You look at Peter Thiel. You guys know who Peter Thiel is, right? Right, exactly. Like he literally has built like so much wealth in his Roth because he took money from his Roth IRA and invested in PayPal and in Facebook. And we're just talking just like little bits because remember when you qualify for Roth, it's like you're not making all that much money in the beginning. So he set up Roth at some point in his life, and then he's just been turning that over. And he's got hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it's a billion. I think he has a billion dollar. A billion dollar Roth IRA. Crazy, right? But he, he was the bank for businesses. It could be the bank for properties, which are just another form of business, right? When somebody brings you a project, you're essentially buying that person's little business. And you're just doing it over and over and over again. So, so cool. So a couple of final points. You're going to talk to somebody about uh, borrowing some money from you so they can do their deal. What kind of things should they be bringing to you to talk about? It? Fully executed contract to purchase the property, right? You can get into theoretical discussions if you want to, to everybody who might go buy a house. But eventually, this thing's take a lot of your time, right? So I would suggest you tell people if they want to have a discussion, at least have something under contract. How do I get it under contract if I don't? Have the money already. Tell those people to come here in January and February and March. We'll talk about that bit. All you need to know as the lender is don't waste your time on something that maybe is going to happen, maybe won't. Have your borrower, have the house under contract, and then let's see if you've got a good deal. They can hopefully get out of it if they don't, right? Yeah. Um, estimate from the reno for the renovations from a licensed insured contractor. Ask for that information. Help the borrower help themselves. You look this person up. Make sure they are licensed and they're insured and they have uh, all the things they need to be a qualified contractor to do the work. Proof of insurance. Did you know that you can have the insurance policy that protects the house and therefore you as the lender prepaid in advance? Prepaid for six months or a year's worth of insurance. If you sell the house before then, you can usually get some of the money back. But by the way, insurance is relatively inexpensive. It's not my problem. I'm going to require you to have a fully prepaid insurance on this property that we all get to see, the certificate of which gets sent to the title company, and my attorney gets to look at it before you get the money. Again, help the borrower help themselves, right? 
you will be a resource as a lender to make sure that all of these boxes get checked. Oh, yeah, I haven't gotten any insurance for this yet. Cool. Cost burns down tomorrow. We all want to make sure that we get our money back, right? Make sure you've got the insurance. So those are all things that you should ask for before you go give anybody any money. All right, okay. that's it. That's what I got. Anybody have questions? Any questions? Okay. You ready to lend money out of your self-directed IRA? Yeah. Ready? Yes. Yeah. Do you have you have you lent money from your self-directed IRA? Or you just buying? You're like, no. You're like I know, so you're not worried. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's got a hundred units. That is his IRA. Okay. So when you get tired of dealing with the contractors and the agents and the sales process and the home inspections and all the other garbage that you have to deal with as a rehabber, you can decide to just lend other people your money so they can deal with all that stuff and you make 40, 50 percent a year. Nothing no, I, I mean I'm all about, you know, next month it's about building wealth through owning units, which is what this game's all about, right? People are always talking about like fixing and flipping and wholesaling and all that stuff. And that those are just tools that's all earned income. It's no different than being a realtor. That's no different than being in construction. And like that, that's all earned income. Like where we need to take this earned income is into the side that you've taken it into, which is buying assets. The more assets you have that are paid off by other people over a long period of time, builds wealth, uh, a legacy for your family. And so next month, it is all about that. and we're not going to do these live anymore. We're going to make it so that everybody's going to come back in the room. It, it, it'll be catered with Peruvian chicken like we used to. It'll be awesome. Bring everybody back in, right? For sure. Bumpers is great, right? Bumpers is great. Um, and, you know, we'll record it. We'll probably put it behind some kind of paywall. But listen, the real power is in meeting people and doing deals. And negotiating and exchanging business cards like that's where the real network and so with that yeah while we still have a couple of people maybe online does anybody there have any questions feel free to take yourself off the of mute or throw it in the chat we'll allow 10 seconds for you to find the space bar to hold down yeah. 10 seconds all other questions you have. and if not then we're going to do some cool networking in here right. and have you set up a uh, syndicate with past clients ever? This is probably an entirely different meetup, I guess, but how? It is. We, we actually, uh, we do uh, investing in self-directed IRAs and syndicating deals. We actually have it recorded. Jess has it somewhere. You could probably go to our YouTube channel and see where yep. we've recorded a lot of that content and, and put it there. Uh, but Facebook. our Facebook group might have it as well. Um, yep. But no, personally, I've never syndicated. I've always had business partners and we've just done it together. Okay. But one of the big discussions that we just had uh, at our company retreat was that we are going to create a Casa Capital and start syndicating deals uh, to buy businesses in, the, in real estate and to buy assets. And so that, that'll be what I do over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I've just stayed away from it because... Quite honestly, we were just very comfortable doing what we were doing, but I, I want to syndicate larger apartment buildings, right? With good partners. So we're going to talk about those kinds of things. Uh, hit us up. Find us on that uh, Grid Investor uh, Facebook group. Find us at gridinvestor.com. We're on the YouTubes uh, with Jim. Uh, and uh, Mark at the Casa Group, Rob at the Casa Group uh, for email. Drop us an email. Always happy to get together. So with that, we're going to get together with our homies here in the room. Uh, thanks, everybody, for checking in online. We'll see you here, apparently, maybe with chicken next month. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you.